Hey everybody, we're back from the second installment of Your Table is Ready. Again, you gotta check out the replay. We came from Psalms 23. It talks about the Lord being our shepherd, but for this past Sunday, we made the Lord our chef. The word chef means chief. That means he's in charge of everything. We realize that even when we're walking through the valley, he's already preparing a table. So that's why we really don't have to wait till the battle's over. We can praise God while we're walking through what seems to be death. I also realize that a chef many times works behind the closed doors. And many times we are discouraged because of a closed door. But a closed door does not stop God from working in your life. So check out the message in its entirety. I know it's going to bless you. As always, thank you for subscribing, for following us, and for connecting with us with Evangel Nation. Our church is growing all across the country, all across the world, because of people that are committed to our local assembly like you are. We're actually becoming universal because of the grace of God. We believe that he gave us a great commission to go into the world and to preach the gospel. And so when you put your hand to the plow along with us, you make that opportunity possible. So again, thank you. God bless you. May heaven continue to smile upon you. That's our prayer. We'll see you real soon. Peace. The Bible says this, you spread out a table before me, provisions in the midst of attack from my enemies. You care for all my needs, anointing my head with soothing fragrant oil, filling my cup again and again with your grace. Again, that's a term mise en place, which is French for setting in place. We established last week or two weeks ago that the word chef comes from the word chief. He's the one that oversees all of the cooking. And I believe the Psalms even call God the chief musician. In other words, he is in control of it. everything we will face, and he's setting things in order. It was a couple of weeks ago, I was out eating, and I had preceded my family to get to the restaurant. And since I'm on a tight schedule, and uh, some of the other individuals in my family have a looser schedule, They showed up a little bit later, and I caught myself being smart, leaning to my own understanding, and I ordered before they arrived. And I didn't just order anything. I was being special. It was about noon, and I ordered breakfast, because breakfast should be quick. It should, the order should be in and the food should be out. Now, keep in mind, two of my best friends in all the world showed up about 15 minutes later. It was three, actually. Three of my best friends showed up 15 minutes later. And I told them I had already ordered and was smiling. They said, that's cool. We know you have to leave. And they ordered after me. And do you know what happened? <laughs> Their food came out first. And my food came out last. Because it was my endeavor to give the chef a rush order. But every now and then, even a rush order does not work out the way we desire it to work out. I want to submit to you that even though God does not require reservations, there are times he requires a wait. And his time is not our time. You know, sometimes uh, we expect God... To give us a microwave blessing. <sighs> yeah, we expect God to give us a microwave blessing. 
but he would rather use the crock pot. And I want to submit this to you that just because you're in a rush doesn't mean God should be in a rush. Because God is never unprepared, even though we feel we are. This is why the Apostle Paul reminds us to be anxious for nothing. But with thanksgiving and prayer, make your request known. Because the tendency and the temptation is to become anxious when God is not moving as fast as we want him to. I want to continue talking from the subject titled, Your Table is Ready. But here's the thing. Many of us go to restaurants week in and week out and never meet the chef. Yeah, the chef, many times, I was a preacher, I preach like this, is behind closed doors. Some of you are complaining about the doors that have been shutting your life, but you don't recognize the chef, God, is behind that closed door. This is why you have to mature to the point where you learn to celebrate open doors and you've learned to seek God in closed doors. God, thank you for shutting doors I wouldn't shut on my own. Thank you for protecting me from the hand of the enemy because if I would have had my way, I would have been a wreck right now. But thanks be to God that always causes me to triumph. I just need you to take five seconds just to give God glory for every door that he shut. Every door that he's closed. Some of you wouldn't be married to the person you're married to right now if God would have allowed you to walk through that door. But thanks be to God she didn't return your phone call. Because God will work behind closed doors. I'm a living witness. And the reason the kitchen is behind the closed doors is because many of us can't handle what's happening in the kitchen. There was one restaurant, I won't call which restaurant it is. I went into the kitchen because I lost something. And let's just say, because I went in the kitchen, I didn't return to the restaurant. Because oftentimes you can't see what happens behind that closed doors. And this is why it's for authorized personnel only. This is why you're not able to get back there. Because if you get back there, what you see may turn you off. And let's be honest, cooking can be messy. See, y'all do craft mac. Okay, that's why y'all don't know it gets messy. <laughs> Cooking can be messy. It can be messy. But good chefs, great cooks, they clean as they go. This is why your life is not as bad as it could be because God has a way of cleaning as you go. This is what we call sanctification, that God will clean you as you go. He already justified you. He already made you righteous, but he cleans up as you go. Because let's be honest, um, the kitchen is not the only thing that's a mess. Sometimes we feel like we are a mess. So God is behind the closed door. You can't always see what he's doing um, because he's the chef. And he's working on Sometimes something and sometimes working in the kitchen can spoil your appetite. We all know employees who work at a restaurant but won't eat there. Because sometimes working in the kitchen will spoil your appetite. But the Bible makes it very clear in the text that this chef is preparing a table. Now, before we get to the table, we have to understand that he's speaking from experience. The writer is because he's also been a shepherd. And he ascribes the identity of shepherd to God the Father. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then the verse that precedes the verse we're going to look at, he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. In other words, the valley precedes the table. 
And sometimes the enemy does not want you to make it to the table. He wants you to die in the valley. And look at your neighbor and say, I refuse to die in the valley. I understand this, that a valley is always located between two summits. And so the table is not just any table, it's a landscape. It's elevated, but it's also flat. It's called a mesa. So this is not always a physical table, but it's a literal table. It is geographic just as much as it's the item you see in your kitchen. And so he says this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Isn't it amazing the enemy's trying to get you so anxious so you never get to the table? The enemy's trying to cause you to be so distracted by the illusions that appear to be death. And death is when something ceases to fulfill the purpose for which God created it to be. In other words, the enemy is telling you you're not going to make it. The enemy is telling you you're not going to amount to something. The enemy is telling you that God's word is not true. But I came in to declare that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. I came in to tell you that you're too close to the table to die in the valley. And let me encourage you, while you're in the valley, many times shepherds would leave and assist in the valley while they would go ahead. So while you're in the valley, God's preparing your table. While you're in the mess, God's preparing your message. And so this is why you can't wait until the battle's over. You got to learn how to give God praise in your now because you know he's going to bring you to your next. I came to preach to everybody that's in a place that you don't want to be, a place of discomfort, a place that's got you low. That's your valley. But yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will feel no evil, for you are with us. Yeah, I may not have money, but I still got God. May not have the bill of health I want, but I still got God. May not have all the friends that I want, but I still have his presence. And as long as I have his presence, he gives me something they can't give me, and that's called joy. Can we have an old school moment? Would you just declare this joy that I have? The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So he prepares the table, but we have to endure The valley, because if I can make it through this, then God will give me that. And Let me give you just a workable definition of what a table is. A table is the designated area where you and I experience what the chef is preparing or what the chef has prepared. So I'm grateful that God is in preparation. No matter where you are now, God is preparing for your next. We could just shout right there. This is prophetic. That means you have a next. If God is preparing your next. And while you're in the valley, you can't see the table. But if you hold your peace, let the Lord fight your battle, you'll get to your table. Am I teaching all right today? Let me give you this point since I'm going to take my seat. Um, This is how you're able to identify your table. First point. Your table should be cleared. Your table should be clear. If you've ever been to a restaurant, you don't go sit at a table that has a cup with lipstick on it. Your, your table has to be cleared. This is why we have busboys, because nobody wants to sit at a table that has not been cleared. And so as I stated before, the shepherd would leave his understudy in the valley with the sheep. And he would ascend to the table. And there at the table, before the sheep ever shows up, before the flock ever shows up, he's preparing for them. Yeah. And sometimes they had to stay in the valley for a couple of days. But while they were in the valley, the shepherd 
was trying to find every crevice with a serpent in his vicinity where he would put oil and crack the crack because it acted as a repellent for snakes. And there was also a particular weed called commas that was very dangerous for the sheep to digest. They liked commas weed because it tasted delicious, but if consumed, it could be deadly. So what God, the shepherd, was doing was pulling up weeds that we would be attracted to that look good, but they were not good for us. Some of you have lived long enough to know that everything that glitters is not gold. And so God knows what your temptation is. He knows what your proclivities are. And he begins to pull things up before you get there. He's clearing the table of everything that you can handle because he'll never put more on you than you can bear. And so he's clearing the table. That means if you're at the table now, you can handle everything you're facing. Say this, I can handle it. I can make it and I can take it. I can handle it because God has gone before me. Before you get to today, God was already here. This is why he knows what mercies you need before you need them. And he gives you new mercies based upon the task he sees you facing. So while you're still in the valley, he's clearing the table. But pastor, what about the enemies I'm facing? Understand this. There were some more enemies that you were not facing that he already dealt with before you got there. Because this is how the old saints used to preach. I know y'all don't like old school stuff, so I'm going to stay in the modern vernacular. But let me have an old school moment. The old saints taught us that he kept you from danger seen and unseen. Some of you only praise God for what you can see. But you haven't learned to praise God for what you can't see. So I've learned to celebrate God for the yeses, the noes, even the things he allowed me to face. Because he won't allow you to face a Goliath unless he can see you beating him. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So he clears the table. Sometimes we bring the clutter back to the table and we have to clean it again. So the table should be cleared. It should be clear. So the table should be clear. And say the environment was clear. Now watch this. When he clears the table, he turns a plateau into a pasture. Because understand, the table is a plateau. And that's how some of us feel in life, that we've plateaued. That we've come into a place where it seems like nothing has happened. Anybody ever got bored with life? It seems like you're not doing bad, but you're not really doing good either. And you feel like you're stuck. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. That's why some of you are so depressed right now because you feel like you're stuck in your state. You think you're stuck in your status. You think you're stuck being single. You think you're stuck being broke. You think you're stuck being defeated. But God says, listen, if you give me an opportunity to prepare your table, I can turn a plateau into a pasture. A pasture is where you eat. A pasture is where you get your nutrients. A pasture is where you get what you need for life and for godliness. How many people know that God can make any desert bloom? So he clears the table. Your table should be clear. Second, your table should have a chair. What good is a table if you don't have a chair? A chair is the place you find rest. A chair is the place you find comfort. A chair. A chair. A chair requires trust. So you can love somebody and not trust them. But the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not to thy own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. So you need a chair. You know what I realized the other day? I know some of you were brilliant and you knew this like 10 years ago. And you say, Pastor, you're just a little slow. Well, bear with me. For the last 12 years, I've been looking for comfort. And I realized I didn't read the small print when I signed up to be a pastor. Maybe even when I signed up to be a child of God, I didn't read 
the small print that says something like this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. Man's life is short and full of trouble. I didn't read the small print. Some of us celebrate Pentecost, but one of the things the Holy Spirit is called is a comforter. Why would he send another comforter if things were going to be comfortable? You don't need a comforter when things are comfortable. You need a comforter when things are uncomfortable. And so what every table has is a seat where you can find rest in him because the safest place in the whole wide world is the will of God. And you know that you're at the right table when there's a seat. Can I help you, Evangel? This is why we can't hog up all the seats. That's why we have to be gracious enough to move over and not think God has called us to move on. Because there's other people that want to find the same table you have. Have you ever shown up late to a party and people acted like they didn't want to move? You were like, well, I can just sit over here by myself. Because chairs indicate that there's room for you. And that we're inviting you to stay a while. So this is why after 15 years, I'm still seated in the pastoral office because I found a chair. I found a resting place. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. You know, in biblical times, when you're in the wilderness, you don't have a chair, so you have to sit on a rock. In fact, Jacob was so sleepy that a rock was his pillow. Because a rock is where you find rest in a weary land. You gotta look for your chair. You gotta look for your chair. If you're dating somebody, they never have a chair for you. They never carve out time in their busy schedule for you. You, you gotta really question whether that's your table. Let me help everybody that's dating a merry man. If somebody else is already in your chair, God didn't give you the anointing to be a side chick. That, that means that table probably is not for you. Because when there's a table, there'll always be a chair. Because God will never have a person sharing a chair. You could be the same purpose and have a different assignment, but you got to look for your chair. And God, when is it going to be my time to sit down at a table when he makes a chair available? Because there are times where you'll get there before the chair gets there. And they'll have to ask the waitress or the waiter to pull up a chair so you can sit down. This is why you shouldn't leave the table prematurely just because the chair was not there. Because sometimes you're an unexpected guest. And it takes time to accommodate you at the table. But sooner or later, you should have a chair. You should have a chair. You should have a chair. At our home, we have a table with chairs. Some of them are not occupied. But as the Lord continues to expand, our family. We, we even have a high chair for baby Paige. Yeah, because high chairs, someone said this, are for babies. But every table should have a chair. You should be able to find rest when you find a chair. Look at somebody say, sit down somewhere. Sit down somewhere. I'm, I'm serious. Sit down somewhere. Don't sit down anywhere, but sit down somewhere. Because at the table, you're going to find rest. And then at the table, you're going to find condiments. Yeah, you, 
you, you, you're going to find condiments. Condiments are the things that add flavor. I'm still in the text, I promise you. The things that add flavor. You know, McDonald's has a commercial, and I asked God, was he speaking to me through the commercial? They showed a picture of a burger, and they said, this is not mess. This is flavor. This is not mess. This is flavor. Anybody ever eating some bland food? And you know you needed some flavor. I don't know what we have up here today. Let me experiment for a minute. Let me see. Uh, uh, where's the salt? Where's the salt? Somebody point me to the salt. Is salt up here? Salt up here? Other side. Other side. The salt's right here. Right here? Right here? Wow. This is some powerful salt. But you expect to see salt on the table. Yeah, you expect to see salt on the table because it adds flavor. Yeah, the Bible says he prepares a table in the presence of enemies. That doesn't mean the enemies have a seat at your table. The Bible doesn't make it clear, but it does say that the enemies still exist around the table. So you got to learn how to find comfort even when there's enemies or opposition all around you. And so you'll find condiments. This is salt. You got to learn how to handle salty people. There's going to be condiments on your table you, because salty people are going to add flavor to your life. These, these are people who are behaving in a resentful, bitter, or irritated manner. These are salty people. People and you want to get them away from your table, but those are the people that add flavor to your dinner. And the truth of the matter is, many of us are trying to run, trying to avoid, but God said, I left them there for a reason because you wouldn't enjoy this moment if they were present. How would I know your statues if I was not afflicted? It took a moment in time. For him to embrace it. Can you handle salty people? Most of us leave the table because we see the condiments. And some of us have high blood pressure because we've taken in too much salt. <laughs> salty people will run your blood pressure up. Instead of it getting better, they choose to remain bitter. That's going to be on your table. And you can't say this is not the table God's called me to because it has some salt on it. You're going to have to deal with salty people. I know no salty people go to Evangel Fellowship on 2207 East Cone Boulevard. But you that are watching online, you're going to have to deal with salty people. People that's been divorced for 15 years and still as mad at their husband as they were when they first got the divorce. These are, they may have good reason to be salty, but these are people who are resolved in being resentful. Praying for salty people, they're going to be on your table, around your table. Yeah, and then you're going to have to deal with uh, spicy people, spicy people, spicy people. Right here, right here. Let's do pepper. We're going to do pepper. Yeah. Cayenne. Pepper. You sitting around some spicy people. Some spicy people. Spicy are people who have a lot of flavor or attitude. You ever seen somebody that has an attitude? Even on Sunday, they got an attitude. They, they are spicy. You sit in their seat, they're going to show you how spicy they are. They have an attitude. You look and speak, they look at you like, who you looking at? They spicy. Spicy, spicy. See, spicy people will cause you to experience church hurt. Spicy. 
Sometimes there's spicy people on the usher board. And sometimes there's spicy people in the choir. Just spicy. Spicy people in the pulpit. Just spicy. But it's the spiciness that gives your life and your table flavor. How would you know he could solve it if you never had a problem? You need spice. There's young spice. Ooh, can I preach? And there's old spice. <laughs> it was being petty. There's old spice. But you got to deal with the spiciness of your table. And many of us leave the table because of the condiments that are on the table. We don't want to deal with spice. We want to deal with spice. And then let me speak to all the saucy people. All oh, the saucy people. Saucy, saucy people. Some of y'all can't go anywhere without putting sauce on your food. Before you order the food, you ask for sauce. There's a certain ethnic group that loves sauce. Don't y'all look at me funny. You go to Chipotle and get the vinaigrette. You go to Bojangles, and when you get home, you put hot sauce on there. You, you saucy. You, you go to the Asian restaurant. You got sweet and sour, soy sauce. You know the doctor told you to lay off of the soy sauce, but you're not listening because you're saucy. You don't even want to eat chicken nuggets or chicken tenders without sauce. You putting stuff on a chicken nugget that should not be there. I remember when I was a kid, I used to eat honey on my chicken nuggets. Serve on my chicken nuggets. It didn't matter as long as it was sauce. Because it's something about sauce that even if the food is bland, it'll bring the flavor out. See, some meat is so good, you don't need any sauce. But people that are struggling cooking a little bit, you need some sauce. Because sauce can change the outcome. These are people that are rude, that show no respect. That's saucy people. And some of you, you feel disrespected every day because you're dealing with saucy people. David had to deal with saucy people. In fact, his name was Saul the Saucy because he was rude and disrespected David every day to the point the Bible says he threw javelins at him. He threw spears at David, and David had to duck and still deliver because he had to deal with sauciness. At your table, you're going to find saucy people that are rude and disrespectful that will say, isn't this the carpenter's son? You're going to find disrespectful, rude people. And let me say this, to be honest, they don't always know they're saucy. But you know they're saucy. And as much as we love sauce in the restaurant, sometimes we don't like sauce in life. Sometimes we just want our plain meal, but that's why your life has no flavor. Because you don't know how to deal with saucy people. I love Evangel Fellowship. I thank God for all the saved and saucy people that belong here. Because sometimes when they saved and saucy, those are the people that keep me on my knees. And sometimes they try to qualify. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's your saucy self. But it's what adds flavor is the sauce. Some of y'all are proud of your attitude. And that's why you're the life of the party, because it always adds flavor. See, the only condiment on your table is not sugar. See, we just want everything to be sweet. Sweet, sweet. Sugar doesn't go on a potato. I hope it doesn't. Last time I checked, it didn't. Maybe a sweet potato, but not, we're not talking about a white potato from Idaho. It doesn't, and we can debate. 
whether sugar belongs on grits. Well, what my people that say no? You gonna just ride with a no, no? Give me some salt and pepper. What my people that say I love sugar on my grits? Y'all giving God praise. Why don't you go get some grits after service? But sometimes God sends salt and not sugar because sugar is not appropriate for bringing the flavor out. That's why he'll send you friends and foes to bring out the flavor in your life. And this is why God will allow some people to have sweet grits and some people to have pepper and salt grits with butter. Somebody saying cheese. Because he knows if your grits were sweet, you wouldn't eat it. So he knows your palate. So he'll make it a little salty for you because it'll create an appetite where you will finish it. This is why you can't compare what God is doing in your life to what he's doing in somebody else's life. Because he knows the plans he has for you for good and not for evil to give you a hope and an expected end. I need you to give God praise for all the condiments on your table. Yes, it's salty. Yes, it's saucy. But I still got a reason to give God glory. Yes, I had to deal with some spicy people at work. But praise be to God that always causes us to triumph. How far somebody say, I see favor and flavor on your life. This is why you can be hood and educated. Because I see favor and flavor. Some of y'all get it twisted. Y'all gonna run up on the wrong person one day judging a book by its cover. You know all the spicy and saucy people I had to deal with in my past. David had to deal with Goliath. He had to deal with the father that abandoned him. He had to deal with Saul. He had to deal with the wife that didn't want him to praise. He had to deal with the lion and the bear. Oh my. But it prepared them for what's ahead. You can have favor and flavor. Let's be honest. Your foes developed you more than your friends. Sometimes salt develops you more than sugar. When I was a kid, that's all I ate was sweet things. But as I grew older, I learned to appreciate other condiments. Because they add flavor. And some of the things in your life you want God to take out, if he took it out, he'll take out the flavor. And that's why he gives us the remedy. He says the remedy to all those condiments is oil. Because I'm going to put you in the presence of your enemies. But I'm not going to leave you there empty-handed. I'm not going to leave you there stranded. I got oil on the table. And I don't just anoint any part of you. I anoint your head with oil. You dealing with all these condiments, all these salty people, saucy situations. But God says, I've anointed you for it. Without the anointing, you wouldn't be able to handle it. But with the anointing, you can. See, the reason he put anointing on the sheep's head, among other reasons, because sometimes the sheep would have to deal with competition. And he put oil on the head so they would slip off the competition, which was sheep. Because when you know you're anointed, it eliminates the competition. Let me try that again. See, when you recognize God has put his oil on you, you realize nobody can replace you because you're one of one because God has anointed you. This is why we can't be in competition with one another because God has anointed us specially for a specific assignment. And you can't do what I do and I can't do what you do. I know some of y'all got depressed when y'all saw these condiments, but you're not going to be able to deal with it unless you got oil. 
That's the remedy. He says, I'm going to leave the enemies there, but I'm not going to leave you without an anointing. So the enemies are still there. You anointed for it. And one thing the enemy doesn't want you to believe is that God put oil on you. And the reason the oil was there again, so that when they butted heads and they got locked up, they could slip out of stuff. Because the oil is a lubricant. And so the oil breaks ungodly connections. Stuff you thought you were going to be stuck in. Because your horns got stuck in it. God knows how to release you through oil. Oil will disconnect you from the wrong people and connect you with the right people because oil doesn't mix with everything. Some of you complaining about the condiments on your table, but when's the last time you checked your oil? I'm anointed for dealing with mess. I repeat McDonald's once again. It's not a mess. It's flavor. And flavor is going to produce favor in your life. Y'all still with me? So he anoints my head with oil because snakes can't stand oil. I think you should have a cup. Y'all see how Pastor O is staying with these C's, alliteration? That takes time, energy, and effort. Yeah, that should be a cup on your table. Because the text says, he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over, still in the tub. Text. The cup represents a covenant or a promise. In other words, this is what the king would do. The, the, the king would keep on filling your cup as he found pleasure with you. I want you to understand this is what the voice says. It says, he keeps filling my cup again and again. I believe that's more of an accurate translation. Theologians argue does it mean overflow or does it mean to the brim? Or does it mean again and again? But one thing I know about God, God doesn't waste. In fact, after he fed the 5,000, he said, go pick up the scraps because I don't waste anything. So I can't see God just pouring oil or pouring juice in a cup that overflowed to a table that was not going to be used for a purpose. And I came to take even the stuff you think is wasted, it can be used because some of you grew up on an apple orchard and sometimes you could find bruised apples, but you don't throw bruised apples or bruised bananas away because bruised apples, even though you can't sell them, they can be used for applesauce, they can be used for apple pie, they could be used for apple dumplings, they can be used for apple butter. This is what God does. He takes all things and makes them work together for the good because nothing is wasted. Let me prophesy to somebody while you're waiting you're not wasting waiting time is not wasting time why don't you help me preach this look at somebody and say waiting time is not wasting time I know you've been waiting for a long time but Job says I'm going to wait to my appointed time because my change is coming because waiting time is not wasting time wasting time Means God doesn't have any value for it, but the waiting gives God enough time to do what He said He was going to do in your life. So I like the text. It says He keeps on filling my cup. I don't know if you like me. Before I order something to drink, I ask them a question of the tape. I said, "Can I get free refills?" See, some of y'all balling, shot calling. I'm balling on a budget. I got another baby on the way. I need to ask these questions. Do you have free refills? I know you ordered a virgin strawberry daiquiri and don't care if it's free refills. And, you know, just keep them coming and just add it to my tab. But no, I'm on a budget. 
And if you're not on a budget, I want to invite you to get on a budget because your budget tells your money what to do. Brother Walt, especially when I know I'm going to a restaurant thirsty, that's a question I must ask before you start pouring. Can I get a refill? Because you don't know how thirsty I am. And a good waiter or waitress won't allow your cup to go empty. They'll keep on filling it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And that's what God does with your life. Even when you feel like you're going under, even when you feel like it's getting empty, he keeps on giving you refill after refill after refill after refill after refill. You thought that last sin was going to take you out, but he had a new cup of mercy. And his mercies are new every morning because he kept on giving you a refill. If you ever been close to empty, but God poured you some more drink in your cup, you got to give God some praise right now. And if you need a refill, I tell you to open your mouth and say, fill me up till I overflow. I want to run over so I can bless everybody around me because I know that you're able. Again and again and again. My enemies thought it was going to be the last time. But God said, I got some more juice in my picture. I got some more anointing in my picture. I got some more favor in my... Hey, I need a refill. So I can digest this because I need a refill. I need a new promise. Yesterday's gone. Today I'm in need. Fill me up. So the king, when he's pleased with you, he keeps filling you up. This is why we're going to go into a time of prayer. We need God to fill us up. The old saints taught this, that there's one filling, but there's many refillings. This is what they said. And we're coming for a refill. A refill. See, some of you had deceived people and made you think, made you think, or made them think that you were on the same glass from 1988. But God has been sneaking you refills. I'm here today. I didn't faint because he gave me a refill. Some of y'all got the same glass, but a refill. You don't need a new glass to get a refill. Some of you in your marriage, you got dry, but God refilled your marriage with the same person. You didn't need a new cup. You just needed a new refill. You know, in the 90s, it's like my daddy got more amens on that. I tell you, you don't need a new cup. You just need a new refill. Oh, man, I'm going to have to come to kiss. Uh, you don't need another glass. Another refill. You, you don't need another church. All you needed was a refill. You don't need a new container. Sometimes you just need some new content. So my cup running over because I got some free refills at the table. Because I come to the table thirsty. Especially if I go to eat after I've been to the gym. I try to drink water first. I try. I fall short, but I try to drink water first. <laughs> but I'm definitely going to get a refill. And watch this. Sometimes the waitress can see that I'm really thirsty. She'll start bringing me two glasses at a time. See, when God sees you're hungry and thirsty, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Some of us giving us double because of the hunger we have on the inside of us. And this is what the enemy tries to do. He tries to take your hunger so God won't refill it. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm counting my calories, I say one glass. Even though I really want more. And some of you had limited what God could do in your life. Just one glass. And he said, don't you know I have a whole fountain in the back? But you think I'm just limited to this glass. Say refill, please. Well, oh, if you grew up in the 80s, more Ovaltine, please. Right. Take me back to your Lord. Watch this. And this is what I love. Hold up. But T-Bear, 
Microwave, okay. Yeah. Sometimes you got to leave the restaurant. Or leave the table, not the house. And so sometimes there's so much on the table, you realize, I may want to eat this while I'm going. So a good chef will give you a to-go box to assist you wherever you may go. David says the same thing. He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So David says, I'm taking a to-go box of goodness and mercy because I'm going to need goodness and mercy wherever I Go. I'm so grateful that goodness and mercy is not limited to this building. That goodness and mercy will follow you to work. That goodness and mercy will follow you home. That goodness and mercy will follow you to the doctor. That goodness and mercy will follow you for every opposition you'll face because God has given you a to-go box. And David said, wherever I go, goodness and mercy is going to follow me. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm on my way to my seat. And every table should have compliments. If you've eaten a meal, you got to give compliments to the chef. See, some people come to church and act like they made the meal themselves. But when you know The chef has superseded your expectations. You got a reason to give compliments to the chef. And I want you to take the next 20 seconds to open your mouth. If you know that he's prepared for you a table in the presence of your enemies, I want you to compliment the chef. I thank you for my now. And I believe you're going to take me to my next. I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for what you're doing for me. And I thank you for what you will do for me. God, you are faithful from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sand. Compliments to the chef. This is my gratuity. This is my gratitude. I am grateful. Compliments to the chef. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. Compliments to the chef. Some of y'all acting like you can make a meal like that, but nobody but Jesus could make a meal like that for you. I need somebody in the balcony, even though you in a good seating, even though you got a private reservation, I want you to open your mouth and give compliments to the chef. If you're watching online, you got to give some compliments. Sometimes you got to be in your car and start giving compliments to the chef. Aren't those the best praise parties when you almost got to pull over? Because when you think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you, your soul cries out hallelujah. Compliments to the chef. Some of y'all know when y'all eat something really good, you break out into a dance. Compliments to the chef. I said compliments to the chef. Nobody but God could make this turn out good. Compliments to the chef. I know y'all don't like chef, so let me use chief. Compliments to the chief. I'm so glad I serve a God that's got it all under control. That there's nothing I'm going to face that God can't handle. Compliments to the chief. When my enemies came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled in the fail. Thanks be to God. Compliments. When I'm weak, his strength is perfected. Compliments to the chef. Jesus, through David, says this, by this I know that you favored me, that my enemies don't triumph over me. I wouldn't have made it without the chef. I think some of us are depressed and bitter because we forgot to give compliments to the chef. That while we were in the valley, the chef 
was preparing a table for us. And I want to encourage somebody on today not to die in your valley. The reason we're praising God, because all of us could have been stuck in the valley forever. But thanks be to God for the chef that prepared a table. And the same God that prepared a table for me can prepare a table for you. I don't care how dark your situation is. I don't care how much it resembles death. You can get through it. And you're going to make it to the table. The same psalmist said this, I would have fainted if I didn't believe to see the goodness of the Lord while in the land of the living. But you can't make it without him. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your situation